Well, thank you all very, very much. To the Senate and to the House, it's great to have you back in town. To the members of the judiciary where I once served, it's great to see you also. To our fellow statewide elected officials, and to the people of the great state of Texas. I'm so honored to join you today as we go to work to build an even broader patch of prosperity for everybody in this state. And as has already been articulated, I am especially proud to have by my side the fabulous First Lady, the first Hispanic First Lady in the history of the state of Texas, Cecilia Abbott. You know, it's been from her deep faith and her steady grace that I have drawn strength during our 35 years of marriage. Well, also by my side are two strong leaders who are working to build an even brighter future for the state of Texas, Lieutenant Governor Patrick and Speaker Strauss. Well, today I am proud to report the state of Texas is exceptional. Since my first State of the State address two years ago, more kids are graduating from high school. We've doubled the number of Tier 1 universities in our state. And more Texans have jobs today than ever before in the state of Texas. Now, sure, we had a downturn in the oil patch comptroller, like we do almost every decade. And like every other time, Texas has come roaring back. Last year, when oil hit bottom, since that time over the last year, Texas still added more than 200,000 new jobs. Our national and international standings continue to rise. We are now second in the number of Fortune 500 companies. And with your help, soon we will be number one and the number of Fortune 500 companies. That's right, Paul. And as Comptroller Hager noted for us earlier, if Texas were its own country, we would now be the 10th largest economy in the entire world. Our economy is larger than Australia larger than Canada, and yes, larger than Russia. <laughs> but listen, we all know here in Texas, we're about far more than just the numbers. We're about our people. People like Tiffany Tremont. Tiffany served our country in the United States Air Force. Tiffany has done so successfully what we want to see all of our veterans be able to do, and that is to be able to leave the military service and go very successfully into the private sector. She is now the president, speaker of a company in San Antonio called Silotech Group, a company that provides advanced cybersecurity and IT system solutions. Tiffany, would you stand and let us thank you for your service to the United States of America. But I want to thank Tiffany for something else. She is among the growing number of women who own their own business. Texas now ranks number two in the nation in women-owned business. 
but our goal is to make Texas number one. <clears throat> now listen, we all know that Texas leads the nation in things like oil and gas. Importantly though, Texas is in the middle of an innovation of renaissance that will wean our economy off of energy. Biotech, defense tech, wearable tech, and clean tech. These are technologies that are developed and commercialized in Texas, and they are changing the world in which we live. And get this, the Dallas, Houston, and yes, Senator Watson, the Austin area, are now known as knowledge capitals of the entire world. I wish Speaker Craddock were here so we could hear this. Midland, Midland, Texas, now beats the San Francisco area in the percentage of jobs created by startups. And we will continue to cultivate the generation of entrepreneurs and innovators that will continue to spur that type of job growth. For example, I am so proud to say that Texas now has more public high schools ranked in the top 100 than any other state in America. <clears throat> we have the fourth highest high school graduation rate in the United States. We're second among Hispanics and African American students, and we are first among economically disadvantaged students and the number one public high school in America is in the Dallas Independent School District. <clears throat> now some of these successes build upon the work that we did last session. By every measure, last session was a tremendous success. In addition to improving early education and higher education, we also provided a record amount of badly needed funding to unclog our crowded roads. We delivered the most robust border security effort of any state ever. We did all that and more in just 140 days, all without breaking the budget. In fact, <laughs> it was the taxpayers applauding that. <laughs> and I'll tell you, in fact, we very wisely ended the session with the largest savings account of any state in the United States of America. Well, this session we have new challenges to solve as well as old challenges that need new solutions. The primary goal of government is to keep our citizens safe and secure. That goal is even more important when it comes to our children. Over the course of the next few months, you all are going to cast, cast thousands of votes Few of those votes will involve life or death issues. Your vote on CPS is one of them. Last year, more than a hundred children died in the child protective system. You can vote to end that. We can reform the system so that no more children die in it. <clears throat> now, we were right to inject funding during the interim, but we need to understand that additional funding alone is not a lasting solution. We need more workers, better training, smarter strategies, and real accountability in order to safeguard our children. 
But improving child safety and CPS, we must remember that we must remain vigilant in the protection of parental rights. We must remember that the best place for children, if at all possible, is with their parents. <clears throat> we need to develop a network of nurture. The First Lady and others have been reaching out to faith leaders across Texas to encourage their members to become a foster and adoptive parents. What we need to do is we need to develop, develop a legion of families in every single county or across our entire state who can open their homes and open their hearts to fostering our vulnerable children. When done right, foster care yields tremendous results. For example, despite growing up in state protective care, Kanisha and Elisa Buckner never let their struggles hinder them. Instead, the sisters thrived, overcoming many obstacles and becoming successful adults, dedicated to raising awareness for children in the foster care system. They are with us today, and I am proud to say they are now both college graduates. Kanisha and Elisa, would you please stand and let us thank you for the example you have set of what we can produce in our foster care system. Thank you. Very proud of you. Also with us today are Chris and Eric Calder. They have fostered several children as well as adopting two. Chris says, and I quote, this isn't a sit back and let other people do the work. We all have to be accountable here. Chris and Eric, they're with us today. Would you please stand and let us thank you for your service as foster care parents and I want you to know, Texas is better because of parents like you. Thank you, Thank you both for being here. The callers have done their part. Other foster and adoptive parents around the state have done their part. Now, it is time for us to do our part. To do this right, the budget I have issued today budgets more than either the House or the Senate. Do not underfund this rickety system only to have it come back and haunt you in the years to come. When you tackle the CPS and foster care of this system this session, do it right. If ever we have an emergency item in Texas, this is it. And I am declaring CPS reform my first emergency item in the Texas this legislative session. If you do nothing else this session, cast a vote to save the life of a child. 
Now, our schools are places for children to learn, to explore, to advance. I know firsthand that our schools are filled with some of the best teachers in the United States of America, teachers who were called to their profession. Unfortunately, astonishingly, a very small number of teachers represented at BOHAC have given Texas a very unwanted ranking. Texas reportedly leads the nation in teacher-student sexual assaults. Some of those teachers are not prosecuted. And worse, general, some are shuffled off to other schools to continue teaching in other areas, threatening other kids. We are the ones with the duty and the ability to do something about it. Teachers who assault children should lose their license and they should go to jail. Cindy, I want legislation that puts real consequences for those teachers. And we must also penalize the administrators who turn a blind eye to such abuse and pass these teachers along to other schools. Well, as elected officials, it is our responsibility to protect all Texans. And that means that it's our burden to deal with the consequences of the federal government not doing its job to secure our border. Now, let's be clear about this. We all support legal immigration into the United States. Legal immigration is what has built the United States of America. What must be stopped is illeg illegal immigration and worse, the criminals who conspire with cartels to enter the United States illegally. <clears throat> now, Texas can't change federal immigration laws. What Texas can do is to enforce existing law. There are, there are consequences, deadly consequences, to not enforcing the law. Juan Rios is a criminal alien who had been arrested in Texas multiple times and deported three times. Last September, he went on a crime spree across Texas, killing two people and kidnapping another. One of his innocent victims was Welton Betts. Welton loved God, Paul, he loved his family, and he loved the Dallas Cowboys. After leaving a Dallas Cowboys game last year, he stopped at a Texaco station in Cedar Hill, Royce, where he was gunned down by Juan Rios. Mr. Betts' death is a tragedy. It's a tragedy that's repeated far too often in Texas. And it is time for Texas to take a stand. Some law enforcement officials in Texas are openly refusing to enforce existing law. That is unacceptable.
Elected officials don't get to pick and choose which laws they will obey. To protect Texans from deadly danger, we must insist our laws be followed. <laughs> Senator Perry, this is the session when we will ban sanctuary cities in Texas. And I am declaring this an emergency item so you can get to work on it tomorrow. At the same time, we must continue our efforts to help secure the border. Chairman Bonin, I know you're looking down. Now I'm going to cause you to wake up. <laughs> you just thought that seat over there was handy. I can see all, all the way over there. You playing backgammon on that? <laughs> I bring this up because I know you're interested in it. The new administration in Washington has shown the potential, the potential to finally secure our border. But President Finvez, you probably recall what Del Royal said before you even got to the University of Texas. All that potential means, it ain't been done yet. <laughs> so tomorrow, I'm getting a start on it. Tomorrow in the Rio Grande Valley at our Texas border. I'm going to be meeting with U.S. Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly to discuss the federal government's efforts to strengthen our border here in Texas. <laughs> Chairman Hunter, while the federal government is ramping up, Texas will not retreat. My budget continues the investment made last session, including funding for our DPS officers as well as the National Guard. Texas will not flinch in our resolve to keep Texans secure. Now, we all know that protecting Texans is about far more than just securing the border. I want to thank our law enforcement officers across the state who are on the front lines of keeping our communities safe. Unbelievably, last year, ambush-style killings of police increased more than 150 percent. None of us will ever forget the sniper attack on Dallas law enforcement last July, or the Harris County Sheriff Deputy Darren Goforth killed in cold blood at a gas station in West Harris County, or San Antonio Detective Marconi murdered late last year. These murders had one thing in common. The victims were killed because of the uniform they wear. We have with us today some of our Texas heroes. Officer Gretchen Rocha of the Dallas Police Department.
and Officer Lee Cannon of the Dart Police Department. Both of whom were shot in the attack in Dallas last July. With them are three other Dallas police officers who also have been injured in the line of duty. Senior Corporal Jeremy Borchard. <laughs> Senior Corporal Richard Witt. Senior Corporal Eddie Coffey. <laughs> On behalf of the people of this great state, I want to express to you the eternal gratitude the people of Texas have for you and your service. Once again, let's give them all a big round of applause for keeping our community safe. I want you all to know, Texas will not tolerate attacks on law enforcement. We are going to rise up as a state in support of our law enforcement. I want legislation that increases penalties and makes it a hate crime for criminals who target peace officers simply because of the uniform they wear. Now, protecting Texans also means protecting the most vulnerable, the unborn. I welcome any legislation that protects unborn children and promotes a culture of life in Texas. We are joined at this ceremony today by Cardinal Daniel DiNardo. He is the President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Your Eminence, I commend your commitment to protecting the unborn. And thanks to you and the bishops of Texas for showing respect for the unborn by offering to pay for the burial of fetal remains of our unborn children at no cost. It demonstrates both the dignity and the reverence that every child's life deserves. Chairman Cook, that is why I support legislation to codify this dignity for every child in the future. Every child, both born and unborn, deserves dignity. The butchering of unborn babies for trade in the open market is barbaric. Senator Schwartner, and Representative Burkett. I want legislation that criminalizes the sale or donation of baby body parts. Now we must also do more to help the children that mothers bring into this world. That's why I'm committed to advancing adoption services, 
and developing programs to support the mothers who embrace the blessing of a child's life. <clears throat> and we must also provide our children with the tools they need to succeed. We do that through education. James Madison emphasized the importance of education to our liberty. He said that a well-instructed people are a permanently free people. That's precisely our goal in educating our children, ensuring their perpetual freedom. That education begins with early education, including high-quality pre-K education. Now, don't take my word for the importance of this. 80%, that is 80%, of all voters agree Texas should fund optional, high-quality pre-education for the students in Texas. They want our children doing math and reading at grade level by the time they finish the third grade. Representative Huberty and Senator Campbell, in hindsight, you were absolutely right to champion this proposal last session. You brought high-quality standards to a pre-K system that desperately needed meaningful improvement. So sitting here today, I got to tell you, I'm absolutely perplexed by the budgets that I have seen from the House and the Senate. They nod in the direction of pre-K, but they really turn a blind eye to the goal of achieving high-quality pre-K. Do your constituents know that each session you vote to spend about $1.5 billion in unaccountable pre-K? The purpose of high-quality pre-K is to set high standards, evaluate them, and eliminate what doesn't work is to ensure the pre-K works rather than wastes taxpayer money. If you're going to do this, do it right or don't do it at all. Now, you were also right last session to advance Texas universities to be among the very best in, the, in America. While we see so many of these colleges competing to attract five-star recruits to athletic programs, Texas has been leading the way to attract five-star recruits to our academic programs. Senator Nelson, you were right. The Governor's University Research Initiative that you funded last session brought internationally renowned researchers to the great state of Texas. As one example, Dr. Richard Miles, a member of the prestigious National Academy of Engineering, is leaving Princeton to come and join the Aerospace Engineering Department at Texas A&M. But hey, who wouldn't want to escape New Jersey and go to College Station? His work places Texas A&M and the state of Texas at the forefront of laser and optical technology that can enhance our national security. Research like this spurs economic development and it helps to create jobs. We must continue our mission to do more than just prepare Texas for the next two years. We also need to put our state on a pathway for national and international prominence for the next 20 years. 
The Governor's University Research Initiative does that and must be fully funded again. And we must do more to help our public schools educate our children. I support our Education Commissioner, Mike Morath. Thank you, sir, for all your great work. Stand up, Mike. He's doing so much, I can't list them all, but one thing that you're doing is making our schools more connected to the internet than ever before. He's developing math innovation zones to improve student performance. He's deploying reading and math academies that make our teachers even better. We're also working to address the growing demands that we see on our charter schools. They do a great job and they deserve to be funded. Our goal is to give teachers the tools and resources they need to help our students succeed. But we must realize we're living in the 21st century while insisting on an education architecture that was built for the 1800s. Both the House and the Senate are right to tackle the vexing issue of school finance now rather than putting it off. I agree, Senator Nelson, it is time to construct an entirely new system with a sense of urgency we must create better ways to fund education. But school finance isn't about financing schools, nor is it about lining the pockets of the lawyers and the lobbyists who try to capitalize off the backs of our students. It's about providing our children with the best possible education. Now, we can try to flood money to every school in the state in an attempt to meet the needs of every single student. Or we could more efficiently empower parents to choose the school that best fits their child's needs. When it comes to education, we need to understand, it's very simple. One size doesn't fit all. What might fit Dan may not fit Joe. Parents, you can use other names, parents, <laughs> just checking Bonnie if you're still awake over there. Parents, not government, are best positioned to make decisions about their child's education. <laughs> Parents should be able to choose a school that is right for their child. Senator Larry Taylor, I agree. No child should be in the wrong school simply because of their zip code. Every child should have a chance to succeed. And yes, Representative Simmons, every child should have the ability to attend the school that's best for them. <laughs> now, it's not like we're being in the vanguard here. 30 states, 30 states already have school choice. Let's make Texas the 31st. Our Secretary of State, you know as well as I do, every man and every woman in this state should have greater opportunity 
for economic advancement. To promote that goal, we need to further diversify our economy by attracting jobs to Texas from outside of the energy sector. The Enterprise Fund has been doing just that. In the past two years, the fund has attracted more than a half a billion dollars in investment capital and has added thousands of new jobs. For example, a corporate expansion of pharmaceutical giant McKesson, which is the fifth largest company in the Fortune 500, will add about 1,000 new jobs. Another 1,000 jobs will come from the massive campus being built by Charles Schwab. The Enterprise Fund has added jobs all the way from Amarillo down to the Rio Grande Valley. Now, if you all don't think that a deal-closing fund is necessary, understand this. Last year, a company that is a natural fit for Texas was lured away by Arkansas. JM, that should be an offense in Texas. <laughs> Even worse, JM, get this. It was Sig Sauer. Oh, yeah, everyone. Sig Sauer is one of the foremost firearms manufacturers in the world. And let this sink in. Texas was outgunned for this project by Arkansas. Texans deserve those jobs, and we need a deal-closing fund that has the ability to fight for them. If you are truly committed to adding jobs and growing our economy, you need to fully fund the Enterprise Fund. Now, one reason why Texas attracts so many jobs is because of the strides that we have made on tort reform. But our work is not yet done. Hailstorm litigation is the newest form of lawsuit abuse. To reduce the economic havoc, I want legislation on my desk that limits abusive hailstorm litigation. Another way for Texas to grow jobs is by cutting taxes and regulations on our businesses. You all remember that Ben Franklin said that the only two certainties in life are death and taxes. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the only good tax is a dead tax. Senator Betancourt, we must continue cutting the business franchise tax until we can fit it in a coffin. And speaking of taxes, we all know that our fellow Texans are being crushed by rising property taxes. Your property tax bills often increase far faster than household income. No government should be able to tax people out of their homes. No government should be able to disregard the private property rights of its citizens. Texas should not stand for this. We have to remember, property owners are not renting their land from the city. That is why we need property tax reform that prevents cities from raising property taxes without first getting voter approval.
We need serious property tax reform with a real revenue cap. And Senator Betancourt, you are on the right track. Thank you for your leadership in this effort. As it concerns our budget, Texans know how to live within their means. No less should be expected from your government. Just as families have to balance needs versus wants, so must we. And that process doesn't start with the next budget that you're working on. It starts now. It starts today. We must cut spending in our current biennium to ensure that we live within our budget. So today, I am directing state agencies to impose an immediate hiring freeze through the end of August. This should free up about $200 million in our current budget. And as you're working on the next biennium, I am confident that we are going to be able to balance the budget without looting the rainy day fund. Now, central to keeping Texas the bastion of liberty in the United States of America, we need to shore up cracks in the democratic process. The faith that people have in their democracy is linked to the trust they have in their elected officials. That trust is eroded if they perceive that elected officials are acting in anything other than the people's best interests. It is time to let Texans know if elected officials have government contracts paid for by the taxpayers. <laughs> Voters deserve to know if lawmakers are working for themselves or the people who elected them. <laughs> and I want to thank Representative Guerin as well as Senator Van Taylor for approaching this effort in ways to avoid the pitfalls that led to the demise of ethics reform last session. And I'm once again declaring ethics reform to be an emergency item this session. There you are. And while we are cleaning up government, we must end the practice of government deducting union dues from the paychecks of employees. <laughs> Taxpayer money shouldn't be used to support the collection of union dues. Senator Huffman and Representative Sarah Davis, they have a good bill that addresses this problem. Let's get it to my desk. Robin Lennon, you know as well as I do, for decades now, the federal government has grown out of control. It has increasingly abandoned the Constitution. It has stiff-armed the states and ignored its very own citizens. Now, this isn't a problem caused by just one president, and it's not a problem that can be solved by one president. It must be fixed by the people themselves.
That is why we need a convention of states authorized in the Constitution to propose amendments to fix America. Now, Representative Miller, you know my support for this. I wrote a book on it. <laughs> but more importantly, there are literally, literally, hundreds of thousands of Texans who are motivated by this. The proposed amendments would include things like term limits, restoring the Tenth Amendment, an amendment that reigns in the federal government regulations, and yes, Representative Workman, it includes a balanced budget amendment. We should demand that the federal government do two things. One is to fulfill important but limited responsibilities as specifically defined in the Constitution. And two, on everything else, leave us alone and let Texans govern Texas. Senator Birdwell and Representative Phil King. You know as well as I do that the future of America cannot wait for tomorrow. So I am declaring this an emergency item today. Texas is the Lone Star State for a reason. We stand apart as a model for the rest of America. Now, it's of no small significance, J.M., that we unite today under the San Jacinto battle flag, one of the most decisive battles of the world that changed the course of history and brought liberty to Texas. It is our privilege and our duty to preserve that cause of liberty. Courageous heroes died so that Texas could be free. Let's use this session to build a Texas worthy of their sacrifice. Let's keep Texas the most exceptional state in the United States of America. May God bless us in our efforts, and may God forever bless the great state of Texas. Thank you so much.